Join us as we welcome Pastor Taiwo Lemache. Taiwo Lemache, fondly called Pastor T, is the President Set Man of God's Chamber Ministries, GCM, a growing, global, life transforming ministry based in Lagos, Nigeria. GCM has God's Chamber Churches as one of its arms, with churches in Lagos and Abuja at the moment, and many more to come up as the Lord leads. Pastor T is a consummate preacher, conference speaker, mentor, and church administrator who derives utmost joy in helping people find their place in God through the teaching of sound biblical principles. Pastor Taiwo has been happily married to Debola Lemoshe. Join us as we welcome Pastor Taiwo Lemoshe. Hallelujah. Give it to Jesus one more time. Give it to Jesus one more time. Hallelujah. Praise God. Lift up your holy hands and just give God the praise this afternoon. Just lift up your holy hands and just worship him from the depth of your heart. Father, we declare that we love you. We declare our everlasting love for you. We thank 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 you. And thank you again and again. Father, we thank you. Father, we declare that we love you. We declare our everlasting love for you. Father, we declare, Father, we declare that we love you. We love, we love you, Lord. We declare our everlasting love. One more time. Father, we declare. Father, we declare. We declare that we love. Lord, we love you, Lord. We declare our everlasting love for you. Oh, Jesus, we declare. We declare that we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We declare our everlasting love for you. Father, we declare that we love you. We love you because you first loved us. Father, this afternoon, we receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Thank you because our eyes are opened. We come into a knowing by the Holy Ghost. Thank you for utterance given. Thank you because Jesus is glorified and your people are edified. In Jesus' name. Amen. We please have your seat. Praise God. It's such a joy and um, pleasure to be here in Manchester this afternoon. Amen. And I will thank my beloved friend, Pastor Chibuzo, friend of 27 years. Amen. Yes, campus days. We were in the same school, same faculty. Not same department. I think you are in animal science. And then, you know, his beautiful wife. I remember the day we went to, um, to you know, the scoping days. That we leave campus to our family house for scoping. Praise God. Such a joy to have my beautiful wife here. And, and then greetings from our church in Lagos. Some of them are online as we speak. Praise God. And thank you for having me be a part of this conference. I'm just going to just contribute my part. Thank you so very much. It's been many years coming. Hallelujah. I'm just going to contribute my part. I believe that since this conference started um, Wednesday, Thursday rather, I believe that we've been hearing messages upon messages. And I believe that like um, Pastor Nee said on Thursday night, that it's what we do with what we hear that actually produces results. It's not just the hearing. Jesus, uh, the scripture says that it is not just the hearers of the word that will be blessed. It's the doers of the word. So I believe that what you need to do is begin to tell yourself what are the actions I'm going to take after this conference because you need to come back with testimonies except that you take action and do what is required of you. Hallelujah. So we're talking about rebuilding destinies. I believe that this is the mind of God for you folks at this time and I believe that God has a word for you. Now one of the things that God specializes in doing is rebuilding things. God is a rebuilder. He rebuilds things. Now, you need to know about God that God will not discard anything. God will not discard anyone because something 
and went wrong with it. You know, Pastor says on, on, when, on Thursday that the reason why we have a rebuilding is because something was built, something was existing before, but something went wrong with that which was built. So it necessitates the fact that it has to be rebuilt. So God is a rebuilder. He will never discard. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, Bible says in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. That was the perfect state that we had. But in verse 2, we are told that there was darkness and there was, there was you know, everything was in chaos. But the next thing we saw is that Bible says, and God said, let there be light. And God rebuilt it. God recreated it. He did not discard it. What he did was to recreate it. In Nehemiah, um, Jeremiah chapter 18, rather, you see a scripture there, a story, hypothetically, about Israel and God. He said the a clay maker was making clay with his hands. And the Bible says the clay was spoiled in the hand of the clay maker. And you know what they did? He didn't discard the clay. What did he do? He rebuilt it and made something new out of it. We are told in Nehemiah chapter 1, when, you know, Nehemiah sent people to go and check the state of the temple in Jerusalem, and they brought a very gory story to him. And the Bible says that, you know, he was sad about it, but he did something. God raised Nehemiah to go and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So we see that God God is a rebuilder. Even his redemption plan is a rebuilding plan because the man he made by default was perfect. Everything was excellent until sin came and sin was introduced and man fell. And from there, God decided to rebuild and restart this stuff and that was how he came up with his redemption plan. So the redemption plan that got you and I saved is a rebuilding process. So God is a rebuilder of destinies. And I've come to tell somebody here this afternoon and those who are watching online, no matter how bad your life may look like at the moment, if you will just walk with God, you will come to understand that God will, I can, will rebuild your life and make it better. Now, this stuff about rebuilding about God is that when God rebuilds a life, he makes it better than what it was before. He does not make it the same way it was before. He makes it better. We are told in Agar chapter 2 verse 9 that who has seen this house in this former glory? Now, who will now see it in this new state, the new glory, the new state, and the Bible says that the glory of this house will be better and greater than the former. That is what God does. When God rebuilds a man and God rebuilds a destiny, he makes it better than what it was before. As a matter of fact, you want to look at man, you know, before the fall and man after the fall. The man after the fall is a better version of the man before the fall because the man before the fall was made after the pattern of Adam, that the first Adam. Now, the man after after the fall was made after the man of heaven, the, uh, the man from heaven. It says in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, the same way we bore the image of the earthly man, we must now bear the image of the heavenly man. I perceive that the image of Christ is far better than the image of Adam. The image of Adam was a defective image, but the image of Christ is a perfect image. The Bible says in Colossians chapter two, verse eight and nine. Bible says in Him dwells the Godhead bodily, and Bible says we are perfect and complete in Him. So I believe that when God changes a man and when God begins to build the destiny that was torn down, he makes it better. We have an example in Job. The Bible talked about Job, that Job lost everything, his children, his business, everything about him in one stance. But the Bible says in chapter 42, that when God was to restore the life of Job, Bible says he made him better. He got twice of what he lost. I've come to speak to somebody prophetically today. No matter how bad your life may look like today, but at the end of this conference, when God is done with you, you look back at what was and what is now and you will thank God that things went wrong so that God could be introduced to your situation and change your situation around in the name of Jesus. So we see that God rebuilds. God will not discard. Even though the fault could have come from your hands, it will not discard. The Bible says I will not in any wise cast out. What it will do, it will step in and it will change your life. Now for this to happen, for God to do a rebuilding, there's something that must be introduced to us. There's something that we must do on our part. I remember you know, Pastor Nee said something on Thursday, and I'll take my reference from there. That, see, for things to work, there must be the God part, and there must be the man's part. It is irresponsible Christianity that makes us abandon everything to God alone, and expect God to do everything now, we don't do anything on our part. There is something to be done on our part. Now, for this to happen, there must be a work upon our minds. Now, I believe you know that when you got saved, 
Your spirit man is in a perfect state, you know. Your spirit man became perfect just like the way Christ is. But there's something wrong somewhere. There's a middle man that is called the mind that needs to be worked on for this thing to, to be, you know, for this rebuilding process to take effect. Please follow me. I'm going somewhere. So God introduced something to us in Romans chapter 12 verse 2. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which that, which that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, let's take it one after the other. It says, do not conform. Now, the word conform means to adjust to. Now, many things that many people do, one of the things that many people do is that when things go wrong, they try to adjust to what has gone wrong. You know, I've lost my job, I've lost my marriage, so I'm just going to adjust, I'm just going to live the way I am, the way I found myself, I'm going to settle in and adjust and just make it work the way it is right now. But that's not what God wants. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. The word transform means you can change it by yourself. That means you can revolt from within and say, no, this situation is not acceptable. I'm not going to adjust to this situation. Yes, I lost my job. Yes, I lost my home. Yes, something went wrong with my marriage, but I'm not going to adjust. I'm going to revolt from within and make something happen. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. And the way the transformation will come is by the renewing of your mind. Now, this is where God needs to do a work in us. Yes, you are perfect in your spirit, but God needs to do a work of adjustment in your mind. Except it does a work of adjustment in your mind, you will not be able to prove. So the reason why that renewal is necessary is that you'll be able to prove. To prove means you come into alignment, you come into understanding that which is good and perfect and the will of God for your life. The reason why many people, even though hands can be laid on you, legs can be laid on you, we can pour a gallon of oil on you, nothing will happen is because there's something that is blocking what God wants to do on your inside. Are we together this afternoon? So God needs to tweak something within you. There must be a paradigm shift. You know, many people, because of the battering, because of the damage, because of the experiences they've had, they have so much, you know, be so bastardized that they can't see something beyond where they are right now. So for God to change the story, God needs to do a work of adjustment in the mind. And that is what I've come to introduce to you in this conference. That God needs to do a work of renewing your mind. God cannot trust the state of your mind the way you are right now. So it will do a work of transforming you to renew you so that you can prove. To prove is to come into agreement. To say this is what God wants, I agree with it. Now can I tell you something, child of God, that as powerful as God is, your mind can limit God. Are you aware of that? The almighty, sovereign, powerful God can be limited by the small mind of man. That God wants to do something for you, God has something big for you, and your mind says, I don't think it's possible. Once your mind says it's not possible, there's nothing God can do except your mind changes. Hallelujah. So to prove means to come into agreement, to come into alignment and say, if this is what God wants, I agree with it. And for that, then the rebuilding will start. Have we together? So the problem with an unrenewed mind is that it cannot come into alignment with what God has or what God is showing him. And I'm going to show you some examples in scripture. You see, what God has for each one of us is far bigger than what our minds can take right now. And until your mind, and that's why the renewal is important. The reason for the renewal is for you to come into the bandwidth of God and understand what God is showing. Unless that happens, God can show you a high and lofty plan and dream. But you know what will happen? Your small mind will constrict and shrink the big things that God has into that which you can see now. So we have an example in scripture, our father Abraham. Now let me tell you the story of Abraham for you to understand where Abraham you know, is coming from. Now this was a man that had you know, married, his own brother Nao got married, Nao had a child who is called Lot. He was still barren with his wife, they didn't have any child. Then Lot grew right in front of Abraham. God told Abraham to leave his father's house to a place he was going to show him. Lot went with him. And then at the end of the day, they became business partners, as it were. That the Bible says that it got to a time in Genesis chapter 13 that the land became too small for both of them. 
uh, you know, Lot had increased, Abraham had increased, the land became too small for them, and there was fight between the servants of Lot and the servant of Abraham, that Abraham had to call Lot and say, you know, we are brothers, so we should not have this kind of fight amongst us. Now, this is what we should do. I will go to the right, you will go to the left. Just pick a place that is most suitable for you. Now, for you to understand how bad the story of Abraham, uh, the, 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 the trajectory of Abraham's life was, if Abraham had had a child, perhaps it should be Abraham's son and Lot that should be comparing, that should be you know, competing. Now, Lot that was born right in front of him had grown, grown up to become a competitor to his uncle. And his uncle had to beg him and say, you know what? We should not fight. If you pick the right, I will go to the left. If you pick the left, I will go to the right. You don't want to trust that foolish boy. The guy looked at the land that was luxuriant and picked the very good side and left his uncle with the patched place. You know, so that, that, that shows you how Abraham's life was. Then God shows up in Genesis chapter 15 and tells Abraham, you are going to have a child. And Abraham tells God, he says, you know what? We've been talking about this for some time. You know, let's, let's cut the chase. Now here, I be, the way I see things, the way things are happening right now, I believe that the only person that will inherit all I've labored for is my servant Eliezer. And God said, no, 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 no. There's one that is going to be born that's going to come from your loins, your own son. And Abraham could not see what God was saying. You see, that, that for God was, you know, when God started with Abraham, Genesis 12, God told him that through him, the families of the earth will be blessed. All Abraham was looking for, if you ask Abraham, what is your major prayer point that I should have a child? God was looking for a nation. He was looking for a child. So when God was speaking, everything in the mind of Abraham narrowed the mind of God, the big things that God had to just a child. And God said, you know what? Now, see, the reason why many people experience delay in their life is not because God wants to delay them. It's the time it takes for you to come up speed with what God is saying. I believe that the 25 years of waiting was not necessary if Abraham had come up speed from day one. Because God was speaking about nations from the day one. He said, through you, nations, nations, nations. You know what Abraham was saying? A child, a child, a child. God said, I'm going to wait until you come up speed, until you come into alignment, until you understand what I'm talking about. And then God, at, at Genesis chapter 50, I, God, I, I believe that God got tired and said, no, we are going to do something about this situation. Abraham, go outside. Go outside. So what have I got to do outside? Go and count the stars. If you can count the stars, so shall your seed be. And Abraham stepped out and he looked up. And the next thing we are told in Genesis 15, verse 6, is that, and he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. What did he see? I believe he saw something and something shifted on his inside. It was at that instance that it, he entered into that which God was speaking about. God had been talking about nations. When he saw, he said, oh, this is what you've been trying to show me all this while. And he believed. And God said, this is righteousness. Except you go to Romans chapter 4, verse 17. You will understand it better. Let's go to Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Put it on the screen for me. Thank you. Are you getting something? Yes. Romans chapter 4. See, this mindset thing is very, very important. There are many people in church, their mindset is so, is so constricted. If God were to tell you that by this time tomorrow, you that you are living in a small room, you are, you are going to have a big industry, say, no, I cannot. You know, like we were told yesterday, and we were told yesterday by Bishop, you know, Bishop Arija told us that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our ways. They are higher. And you see, because they are higher, God is not going to come down to say, no, let's shrink it where they can understand. He will bring you up. He will bring you up. Though his thoughts are higher than your thoughts, he needs you to upgrade to that level. He says, as it is written, now look at this. As it is written, I am going to make you. If God were to open his book for your life, he says, Give me a name, for example. I need somebody's name. Michael. This is who Michael is. Michael is a multi-millionaire in pounds. Michael owns a company. That is the book of God. If we look at Michael right now, Michael does not have a job. As well as that, he's squatting. But if we look at God's book, Michael is not going to have... As far as God is concerned, Michael is a multi-millionaire, has a company. Now, the reality of Michael is at variance with what is in the book. 
Does that make sense to you? So as far as God was concerned, if you look at God's book for Abraham, Abraham is the father of many nations. But you look at Abraham today, he doesn't have a child. Not talk about a nation, not nations. It says, in the presence of him whom he believed, God would give life to the dead and cause those things which do not exist as though they did. I changed that personality to because they are. Now go to the next verse, verse 18. Look at it. Verse 18. Who contrary to hope, in hope, believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. When did he enter into this hope? You know, Galatians 3 told us that when, God, that when God saw what he was going to do, he preached the message to Abraham. So I believe that when Abraham went out to count the stars, he did not count stars. It was not twinkle, twinkle, little star. Number one, number two, number three, number four. What God did was to use that to introduce him to a concept in the spirit, which is called revelation. As he looked into the sky, he saw the day of Christ. He saw the many people that would come into Christ. So he was not seeing stars. What he was seeing was the nation of Israel, through whom Christ will come and the many Gentiles that will come into Christ. He believed that message. And the Bible says it was counted to him as righteousness. Immediately there was a mind sh- um, 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 shift. You know what happened? All of a sudden, he refused to consider the deadness of his body. He refused to consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. Something had shifted in him. And that shift brought a rejuvenation into his body that was now dead. All of a sudden, the body that was dead came alive. All of a sudden, Sarah's womb that was dead came alive because something shifted in the mind of Abraham. So, he against hope. Give me that scripture again. And then, go to verse 19 now. Look at what happened in 19. And not being weak in faith. Now, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and then of Sarah's womb. Next verse. He did not waver. Corruptible man. Okay, I like this, your translation. Uh, uh, okay, I'm birth, I'm birth and belief. I don't know this translation. Never seen it like this before. Okay. Was strengthened in faith. It was giving glory to God. And Bible says, verse 21. 21. 21. Give it 21. And be fully, he had, he had entered into a level that we call the level of persuasion. Fully convinced that God that promised was also able to perform. Now, God must bring you to this level if you are going to experience a rebuilding of destiny. What was done will now become better but except you come up speed and see what God is saying and see what God is showing you, the picture God is showing you, and you tell yourself, if God said it, it is possible, then you might not be able to enter into the new level that God is bringing us to. Are you getting my point? So you see that it's very, very important that we get to the place where our minds must be renewed. Our minds must be renewed. And you renew your mind by first staying in the word and in the place of prayer. So that means that you sit down with the word and you are not just reading white and black. There is a level you engage the word with that the scripture jumps at you. The Bible says that, and the word became flesh. The word can take up flesh and dwell amongst you. And you will behold, you will behold. It says, and we beheld his glory, you know, as of, um, give it to me, John chapter 1, verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and the elders glory as of the begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So you, you, you will come to understand that this word can become literal human being. Because the word is not paper, it's not white and black. That's why you can tear the Bible, you cannot remove the person. The word is a person, is a living entity, is alive, is quick. That is what you should be engaging with, not paper, not white and black. 
Because it is the word of God that brings the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That was what Paul was praying about. That you will come to understand this thing that we are talking about. You will come to this place where you, all of a sudden your heart will be flooded with light. Because it was bothered about the Corinthian church, full of possibilities, but yet lacking. And the division factor was the fact that their mind was on certain things and they could not enter into the fullness of that which God had for them. So he says, you know, you know what? He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, every person in Christ Jesus. But you know what? There's something you guys lack. He says, I pray the Father of glory to give the spirit of wisdom and revelation of him that the eyes of your understanding will not become flooded with light. So that, that heart of understanding is talking about the mind. It will become flooded. All of a sudden, you will tell yourself, wow. So is this what God has been trying to show me all this while I never saw? You know who Gideon was? When the angel appeared to Gideon and said, you are a mighty man of valor, I said, no, me. If you want me to tell you my story, I am from the poorest family, and I'm the poorest from the poorest family. God said, no. What we see about you, you are a mighty man of valor. You can take the whole nation by yourself. He says, no, I'm a poor man. And that is where many of us are. If God were to show you the things he has in plan for you, the things he has planned for you, some of you would tell yourself, no, God can I, I, no, 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 no. It can't happen through me. It can't happen. And then what happens is that God will say, you know what? Angel, stop. Until it comes to the agreement, we can't do anything. Because without your mind, you can't do anything. So there must be a, mind, a mindset shift. And the angel said to him, you're a mighty man of valor. He said, you know what? I won't believe it on this and this happens. Even at that, he didn't believe. He took a vision, a dream that an enemy had for him to believe that he could achieve. And then when he was going to fight, he felt that, well, we are going to fight, we need a large crowd. So he got a large crowd. Because that is what we've been told. And then God said, there are too many. He said, if you, if you know that where we call for men that could fight, it was your wife that pushed you out. Go back home. <laughs> you know, there are some men that say, you just go. They are calling for men. And then, Bible says, a large chunk went back home. You know, for somebody who was naive, now, out of 32,000, a large chunk turned back. And then God said, there are still too many. At the end of the day, when God shrinked his army, it was 300. Wow. For a man that was naive, and God says, you are going to fight them with 300 people. Wow. You need to, you need to know that it takes a mind that is locked up in God to go to fight with 300 men. At that stage, something had happened to Gideon. And he knew in his heart that it's not how many. It is a God that is with it is the God that is with. Amen? I've come to tell somebody and encourage somebody today. See, I don't know what the enemy has done to your life. I don't know how battered you may look like. But I've come to tell you that God has something better. I don't know what you lost, but there's something better. When he rebuilds, he makes it better. But the only thing God needs you to do is change the mindset. You understand? Change it. Change it. If God were to tell you that is, is bringing something massive into your life, don't let your mind shut it down. Don't let your mind shrink it to what you can see. God is infinitely bigger than what you can imagine. The Bible says he's able to be exceedingly, abundantly above all you can ever ask or imagine. God will always surpass your expectations. Amen? So stop shrinking God. You know, we were told yesterday, I think Bishop Wayne told us, about the, the, God told them was taking them from the land of slavery to the land flowing with milk and honey. But you know their problem? Mind. Mindset. Mindset. Sent spies to go and check the land. They saw, you know, everything was the way it was described. Except that they saw giants. And for somebody who is forward thinking, should have thought that, well, well, the reason why these guys are big is because everything is good. The next thing is that, we can't, we can't fight. We can't. We can't. We are like grasshoppers in our sight. And they limited the Holy One of Israel. They are, so, so you see, your mind can limit God. God said, I've given you the land. They said, no, there are Anakims there. We cannot go. Only two. And because we are told in the book of Joshua, because Caleb had another spirit. You know what Caleb did? When Caleb came to Joshua, Caleb told him, he said, I, I, I can still fight when I was, like, when I was 45 years. He said, no, no, what? you know what? When we went there, I saw what they saw. But I brought report according to what was in my mind, not what I saw. Amen? 
Many of us, what we are seeing, what we are experiencing has conditioned our mind. That there's nothing God wants to show you in his moving pictures that will change your mind. And so God says, you know what? We'd rather stop and wait because we can't enforce anything on him until he comes up speed and he agrees with what we are showing him. So the reason why there's a delay in your life is because God is waiting for you to come up speed. The moment you say, like Mary, even though I don't understand how this is going to work out, but be it unto me, according... You know what happened to Mary? The angel was only looking for permission. Mary said, how can this thing be? Normal question. Because I'm not married. How can I conceive? He said, yours is just to agree. Because the power of the Most High is already waiting to overshadow you. The moment you agree, the power of the Most High goes into operation. The moment you agree, the power has always been available to work. It is your agreement that is stopping the power. Let me say this to you. It says, the power of the Most High is waiting to overshadow you. You just agree and say, even I don't understand, just agree and say, well, I don't understand the way this is going to work, but I agree. Immediately, the power of God goes into operation. If Mary had said, well, let me give me two weeks to go and think about it, the power will still be withheld. Current, heaven's current withheld. Until she says, you know what? I've thought about it. I've spoken to Joseph, and we don't like the idea. Power suspended. So it's not that God is not powerful. Your mind is suspending the power. The moment you tell yourself, and that I tell people the best way to, I think my time is almost a minute. There's no timekeeper. I flow. You know. You know, the moment you say, Lord, I agree, God says, You are going to be this. This is going to happen through you. Say, Lord, even though I don't understand, the safest way to say, to, 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 to do, the safest thing to do is to say, Lord, even though I don't understand, be it unto me according to your word. Or do what Ezekiel did. Lord, thou knowest. Thou knowest. You understand. I don't understand because the way things are right now, the way I am right now, the way my life is right now, I don't see anything but Lord, because you are God, you see what I don't see, but I believe in my heart. Out of your way. Amen? And then all of a sudden, you see the power of God move into operation. And then you see that things begin to happen. And things begin to happen. That at the end of the day, you know why God will always do bigger than you? So that you cannot take the glory, you can't take the credit. At the end of the day, everybody will declare that this is the hand of God. You did not contribute anything. So we know who to give the glory to. Amen? If it was what you could do by, your, by yourself, then God doesn't need to take the glory. Amen? It will show you stuff bigger than you. Bigger than you. Bigger than you. Bigger than you. Amen? If it's just, you know, God bless me. You know, when we are praying, God bless me, and somebody's saying, oh Lord, the blessing I'm looking at, I'm, I'm trusting you for, is I just move from this, my position, to the next position. Then you can do bootlicking. You can do office politics to get that. But when God tells you and says, I'm taking from the front desk to becoming the manager, you know, that will take the hand of God. And tell yourself, no, no, I'm not educated. I don't have the qualification. I don't have the necessary, you know, I'm not close to people here. So I don't see how that is going to work out. And God says, no, until you see it, well, the power will be suspended. But the moment you say, Lord, even I don't know how I'm going to move from this front desk to my becoming manager, but I know you said it. If you said it, you are able to do it. All of a sudden, power moves. I've seen things happen to people just because they believed God against every odd. Amen? Child of God, you must believe God against every odd. The odds are against you. Everything that you can see in the physical is against you. But you know what? There's only one thing that is working for you. What God said. What God has said. What God has declared over you. The moment your mind comes to agreement. Your spirit is not already in agreement. But your mind needs to accept it and say, you know what? Even though I don't understand, but I, I open up myself and I believe God for it. I believe that God who has promised is also able to perform. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So he says, do not be conformed. Don't adjust that situation. Revolt on your inside. Tell yourself, I'm bigger than this. I am bigger than this. God is taking me far. Even though I don't understand how, but I know that God who promised me is taking me far. And tell yourself, I can do it. I can make it happen. He says, 
be renewed so that you can prove. Come into alignment. Accept that which is good. You see, everything that God has for you is good. He's accepting it in his perfect will. Your mind must accept it. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. All things are possible. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Join me on your feet. Lord, I believe. All things are possible. Lord, I believe. And let me just share this with you. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, you know in, um, many of us here should know Baba Deboe. You know, many of us should know him in it. You know, in 1981, according to his story, 1981, when he became the University of Redeemed, and then he was a lecturer somewhere, and then all he, he was trusting God for was a three-bedroom flat to move his family to in a downside place called Mushin. Three-bedroom flat. He was trusting God for three-bedroom flat, and God came to him and said, I'm going to give you a city. Now, how do you explain three... You know what a three-bedroom flat is? You know your houses here are... Uh, <laughs> not like what we have in Nigeria. Your houses here are like, you know, you know, you know. And then, you are trusting God for three-bedroom flat, and God says, I'm giving you a city. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? You are trusting God for bus fare for the next man. God says, I'm giving you a, 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 a jeep. How do you explain that? But you know what? God said no. And it, at some point, they got a land. It was very to pay for that land, which was about 18000 at that time. But because what they saw was just four plots. You know, you know the way we shrink things from three bedrooms? You couldn't understand what a city looks like. So he felt that four plots of land, maybe four or six plots of land, is big enough, at least three bedroom. God says, no, I'm not talking about four or six plots of land. I'm talking about a city. Kai! I prayed for three bedroom. He said a city. Then he needs my mind. It needs, God needs to expand my mind. My mind needs to be stretched. To accept that it's a city, not a three-bedroom. Now, at some point, I, there's a message he preached in, I think, 1981-82, the fourth dimension. And I, I believe that this man wrote a book about it too. Um, um, Young Cho, Lee Young Cho, the fourth dimension. He believed God for it. And if you have been to Nigeria, you will know that it's bigger than a city. As well, in fact, the, the current auditorium is three kilometers by three kilometers for three-bedroom flats. God's plan is bigger than your plan. It is you that will come up speed. God is not going to reduce his plan for you. You are the one that will say, Lord, enlarge the capacity of my heart to receive the big things that you have for me. Amen? The big things that you have for me. If God is taking you to nations, don't restrict yourself to where you are right now. God has something big that he asked for you. Hallelujah. I believe this has blessed you. Be talking about.